the feud within the Mokro Mafia is still brewing and is far from over. At this point, it's not even about the missing shipment anymore, but about everything that happened afterwards. The groups are still going blow for blow, and even family members of the fallen men start getting involved and seek revenge for their loved ones. The feud dictates the news, and media outlets in Amsterdam constantly have people on standby to report on yet another incident. Even the mayor of Amsterdam had to admit, at the moment, we can't do anything about it. And I can tell you, he was 100% right. Ben Elf was extremely furious after what had happened at his confidant Mohammed. As the battle goes on, each side continues to up the antes and strike back even more aggressively. At this point, no one is safe. Both camps are on their toes and know that every day could be their last. Some players decide to hide in Morocco or Spain, but most of them stay put in Amsterdam. What would happen next is unbelievable. It's the 22nd of May 2014. What seemed to be a normal evening in Amstelveen would turn into something straight from a movie. Gwinnett is in a shawarma shop, Ruse, on the Amstelsweg in Amstelveen, with his bodyguard and associate. Fun fact about this associate, he actually took the blame when both of them were caught in a car that had two loaded 9mm a month earlier. Gwinnett paid him well for his services, and taking the charge was met with a nice cash reward. While the two are still in the shawarma shop, two other men join them. Gwinnett then leaves the shop with one of those men. As they walk outside, a BMW turns up, and then it all happens very quickly. Gwinnett is struck with an AK and at least one other automatic weapon. He is hit 80 times. Yes, you heard that correctly. 80 times. The man he was with managed to flee and did not get hit. The car quickly drives off and is found a few hours later burned out in Demon. That was the end of Gwinnett Martha, then and there. He was 40 at the time. So compared to all others in this story, he managed to get relatively old. This was such a major turn of events. Suddenly, the leader of the opposing group is gone. Does that mean the battle is finally won by group Hussein and Ben Elf? Is the end of the Mokro feud finally reached? Well, no. It is not over. Not at all. Because this hit had a very strong smell of betrayal. Gwinnett would always wear a bulletproof vest unless he truly trusted the environment and people he was with. After what happened on the 22nd of May 2014, it was later discovered that he did not wear a vest. Here is where Najib Zigi Himish comes in. Najib was part of group Gwinnett since he was young. Gwinnett showed Najib the ropes of the underworld. Najib quickly rose through the ranks within the organization. He was eager to make it big, maybe a bit too eager. He was eyeing for the top spot. As high ranked members such as Najib Bubu started to fall, the only thing that held him back was the leader of the group himself. Gwinnett. Word on the street is that the removal of Gwinnett might not have been orchestrated by Ben Aouf and his group, but it came from within. Najib Zigi Himish supposedly orchestrated the hit so that he would now be the top dog. But that will not be Zigi's only act of treason. If you thought the feud was over now that Gwinnett was gone, you were absolutely wrong. If anything, the feud only got more intense. Dekawi van der Maiden is the son of a Dutch father and Moroccan mother. In the underworld, he was known as a hitman that belonged to group of Gwinnett. The police labeled him as one of the suspects in the event in the Stadsliedenbörte in December 2012, when they did not have enough evidence to put him behind bars. Dekawi was a loudmouth and highly unpredictable. He once served a six year jail sentence for shooting at someone's chest after an argument on a party. On the 18th of August, however, the roles were reversed, and he is the one at the end of a weapon. He is supposed to meet someone on the Borneolan in Amsterdam East. As he arrives, the two start walking. Little did Dekawi knew that there was two other men waiting for him a bit further down the street. All of a sudden, at around 11.15 in the evening, two men jump in front of Dekawi, and he is struck with an automatic rifle. The shooter, however, could not control the AK and only manages to hit him in the leg, which allowed Dekawi to flee. He proceeds to take a left towards the Borneo Cad, 
which would eventually be a terrible decision. He walks right into the arms of the two suspects, who had their scooter parked on the Borneo card and fled the other way around. They proceed to unleash on him again and strike multiple times. He still survives, but has to give up in the hospital a few hours later. The suspects, two men in dark clothing, managed to flee on a scooter. After police investigation on the scene, they found multiple holes in the houses near the crime scene. These could have struck innocent people peacefully minding their business in the safety of their own home. Another sign that these guys don't care about anyone's safety. What happened to resolving these matters somewhere on an abandoned parking lot instead of in the city centre of Amsterdam? Times have really changed. Samir Boyakshiran, also known as Scarface because of the interesting scar on his face, is next in line when it comes to the feud. Samir was from Amsterdam West and built himself an impressive track record in the underworld with an estimated net worth of far over a billion euros. By making the right decisions, he managed to become one of the most important and wealthiest criminals in Amsterdam. Even though he was friends with most of the top dogs in Amsterdam, you can't live the life he lived without having enemies. There is always someone scheming to take your spot. Samir was one of the few that saw the city becoming way too lawless and found shelter in Benahavis, a small city in South Spain. Sometime before Najib Zigi Himish took over Group Gornet, Zigi became friends with Samir Scarface too. Samir was in the upper echelon of the coke business at the time, the Champions League. As you already know, Najib was eager and wanted to rise through the ranks within the underworld as fast as he could. What happened with Gwinnett was suspicious. Him not wearing a bulletproof vest, no one else getting hurt but him, and the fact that Najib was eyeing his spot. What happened to Samir shares many similarities. On the night of August 29th, 2014, Najib and Samir sit next to each other on the outside of a cafe called All-in-One in, in Benahavis, Spain. They are joined by Nafel, another big smuggler from Amsterdam. Samir spent time with them drinking and talking nothing out of the ordinary. He came voluntarily, so he must have trusted the situation. Until exactly 10 minutes to 2 at night, Ziggy puts his arm around Samir, and just a few seconds later, two armed men run towards the group. Samir notices something is wrong and tries to flee, but it is already too late. He is struck multiple times in the back and head. Did Ziggy really just do it again? Was it coincidence or was he now the initiator behind both Gwinnett and Samir's successful hits? Remember, Gwinnett also trusted the situation. The betrayal is once again very strong in this one. Just like that, another major player is gone from the playing field. At this point, you would think there would come an end to the feud as many of the key role players are now gone or in jail. Well, this was absolutely not the case. If anything, the feud kept reaching lower lows. There are now so many people involved, so many families and group members who seek retaliation for what was done to one of their loved ones. At this point, it was not about the 200 kilos that went missing anymore. It was beyond that. Masod Amin Hosseini is a prime example of what is wrong with the feud within the Mokro Mafia. The young guys who are easily influenced are used to fulfill a task and then disposed as if they were nothing. Masod has been a troublemaker and hothead since he was young. He acted before he thought, not a good habit when you're doing the work he did. This would end up shocking the entire country and one family in particular. In his 20s, he often got into it with the police. They knew him very well. Driving reckless, cursing at cops, stealing, petty crimes but soon enough he was involved in serious crimes. If you can remember, the 20th of February 2014, Alexander Alecki Gillis was removed from the playing field in front of his girlfriend's house when he got in his car. Mossad was one of the suspects in that case. That, however, was an event in the underworld. As they say, live by the sword, die by the sword. What would happen on the summer evening in the 13th of July 2014 can be deemed as a national tragedy in which the underworld clashes with the normal world in shocking fashion. Unsuspecting 30-year-old father, Stefan E, is sitting in his blue Fiat Punto in the Konrastraat in Amsterdam. He just came back from watching a football game over at his friend's house. It is quite late at night, 2.15 to be exact, so the street is pretty dark. Masod Amid Hosseini was in the same street as Stefan, and he had a job to fulfill. 
He had to take someone out driving in a blue Fiat Ponto with a certain number plate, and so he did. Masod run towards Stefan's car and strikes him several times. He flees away and an innocent family lost their father there and then. This once again showed the inexperience of these guys carrying out these hits. They are young guys with zero experience. After police investigation, it was not Stefan who was the target. The target was Omar Lekorf, little brother of Yusuf Lekorf, that was a victim in the Stadt Liedenbert on the 29th of December, 2012. Omar lived right around the corner of Stefan and also drove the same vehicle, a blue Fiat Punto, obviously with a different license plate. Right after the incident happened, as it became clear they got the wrong one, chaos ensued among the involved criminals. The following text message of those involved had been revealed by the police. Bro, Jack, Masod's nickname, has made a big mistake. Seriously bro, a very big mistake. Bro, seriously, I am serious. It's not him, it is the wrong license plate. Damn, I am scared to death. Another message. Bro, Jack went running like crazy and hit the wrong white guy. This was the first Vegismord in the Netherlands. An incident in which an innocent civilian is a victim of a feud in the underworld. Unfortunately, there were many more to follow. Stefan left behind a two-year-old son at the time and his wife. Massad, who originated from Group Gwinnett Martha, was in serious trouble. The fact that his own supposed camp ordered the sweep goes to show no one is safe. Like I said earlier, used to fulfill a task and disposed. But the fact that Massad ruined his task made the group even more pissed. It caused a lot of irritation and he became a liability. Gwinnett Martha's nephew, Dennis Mongan, was the originator of the idea of disposing Massad. PGP messages revealed that Massad was supposed to get two new 9mm as a gift. Little did he know it was a trap. He was found in his car on the 3rd of September 2014 with one shot fired from the back seat. There was no sign of a scuffle or anything else so it must have been someone he trusted. That was the end of him. He only managed to make it till 26 years old. Just like that, two of the biggest players in the Amsterdam underworld were gone, and the first innocent civilian fell victim to the feud. The family of Stefan would unfortunately not be the only family that lost their innocent loved ones to this feud. Remember Najib Zigi Himish? He might have finally overplayed his hand, and his betrayal would come back to haunt him. His family is in for a very heartbreaking and unpleasant surprise, and the feud is about to cross international borders.